Good morning. Great to see each of you here this morning on this Memorial Day weekend. And I know you could, could have been somewhere else, maybe out camping or whatever. But we're glad that you are with us this morning and here to worship. And I trust that you've already uh, been in worship. I look back there and I see Nancy. Nancy, good to have you. She had surgery and is recuperating. It's good to have you in church this morning. This morning I'd like to share with you about meeting Jesus at the well. Meeting Jesus at the well. God goes after the lost. Early in his public ministry, Jesus left Jerusalem and he headed north to the region of Galilee. And the scripture makes a a point of emphasizing that he had to go through the area, the province of Samaria. Why did he have to do that? Well, he did it because there was a woman who waited there who was in desperate need of God. And so God sent his son to Samaria to meet her. Let's look at the scripture and, and, and see what it says of this story. It says, now Jesus had to go through Samaria. So he came to his town in Samaria called Sychar, Near the plot of ground, Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Joseph's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to come here uh, to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and Come again. I have no husband, she said. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship him, must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you, I am he. And then skipping down to the end of that story, many of the Samaritans from the town believed in him because of this woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them And he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. A map of of Palestine shows that the shortest distance between Jerusalem and Jesus' home country would be going right through Samaria. And yet, no self-respecting Jew would have taken that route. As you can see on the right there, there's arrows going out around. And those arrows indicate the routes that normal uh, Jews would take if they were going from Jerusalem to Nazareth because they would not walk through that territory of the Samaritans. It would be better to spend many extra hours of walking on the road than to to risk having to associate with those hated 
Samaritans. Uh, now, the Samaritans were a religious half-breed. They were offspring of mixed marriage between Jewish people and occupying Syrians back in their history. They, they, they claimed that they worshiped God, but they set up their own temple in Mount Gerizim, uh, Gerizim and they wouldn't go to Jerusalem to, to worship. And the Jews hated the Samaritans, and the Samaritans reciprocated with hate for the Jews. On an earlier trip in this area, going around, Jesus' disciples had shown their contempt for these Samaritan neighbors by suggesting that Jesus would call down fire from heaven and destroy them. Jesus, of course, did not do that. But that's what they wanted him to do. And so Jesus here seeks out a hated Samaritan. And to make matters worse, it wasn't just that it was a Samaritan, but that it was a woman. The Jews thought it was scandalous for an educated man to speak to a woman in public. Some extremists even objected to men talking to their own wives out in public. And by their standards, if a, if a, a woman was caught talking to a man in public, it was even grounds for divorce. That's how strongly they felt about these things. And yet Christ initiates a conversation with this Samaritan woman. Jesus, meeting the woman at the well, he, he told her that he could provide for her water that would satisfy her thirst forever. And her reply was then, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and I won't ever have to come to this well again. Now there could have been other replies that she could have responded with. She could have said, thanks, but I'm not thirsty. She could have said, uh, I don't need your help. I can come here anytime I want and get wa all the water that I need. Uh, if she had not admitted her need and desire for this which God had offered to her, she would never have been a candidate to receive all that Christ did provide to her. When the Pharisees sniped at Jesus for befriending tax collectors, he responded this way. He said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have, come to call the, not, to, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus came for, for those who are in need. He seeks out the needy, not the well. He, he seeks out those who are poverty stricken so that they could be satisfied, the hungry so that they could be full. Luke says he healed those who needed healing. In our world, what is success? The epitome of success and the reaching of the American dream uh, is that we live a need-free life. To get to the point where we just don't have needs. We want to be financially free. We want to be pain-free. We want to be stress-free. We want to be hassle-free. In other words, if we really boil that down, our desire is to be God-free, to live our lives safely under our control, where we have control of everything in our life. And isn't that the temptation that was before mankind ever since the garden, where Adam and Eve were tempted and said, eat, and you will be as God's. To be in control. Deities are self-sufficient. They owe no one. They need no one. They can be hurt by no one. They depend on no one. They stand alone, solitary, invincible. But the truth is that we can never be need-free. Nor should we really want to be need-free. Go over to the very last book in the Bible, Revelations. Jesus 
chastised, rebuked the church of Laodicea because of this. And this is what he said to them. He said, you say I am rich and I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. The spirit of self-sufficiency is what the Lord spoke against. He he, he said, it's easier for, for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, Jesus wasn't saying that, that riches in and of themselves were evil, but having wealth makes it harder for me to see how needy I actually am. If we think we deserve his favor, or worse yet, if we, if we have done things or, or, or accumulated things, uh, that we think that, 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 that we are sufficient and don't need him, We are in an awful place. But to those who are willing to admit their need, Christ becomes the need needer. He promises this woman living water to quench her thirst, and he supplied it. She received that living water. He healed the sick. He offered He offered friendship to the lonely. He gave rest to the overburdened. He forgave the guilty. But in each case, he was free to work because the recipient admitted they had a need. That's where we all have to start. We all have to start by admitting uh, that we had a need. So the question is this morning, do I need Jesus? Are we willing to be vulnerable to him so that we can receive what he wants to give us. This Samaritan woman was, and she found the Lord true to his word. When the woman asked for living water, she responded to what she understood God was offering in her life. But instead of beginning a theological treatise on salvation, Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband, and come back. I can only imagine what was going through that woman's mind at that moment. Go and find your husband and and come on back and we'll talk. I'm sure her her face fell. I'm sure there was a blush that crept into her cheeks. And and probably she answered a little too quickly and a a little too loudly. "I, I have no husband. And what she said was technically correct. But as many of us do when we're cornered, we pick out one fact uh, that makes us look good out of all the other facts that are around us. She didn't lie exactly, but her answers certainly didn't communicate truth. You're right when you say, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands And the man you're now living with is not your husband. What you've just said is true. She was trapped in a lie. How embarrassing. But at this moment, the woman had a chance to reveal herself to Jesus as she was. To confess her sin. Everyone who does business with God must face a moment such as this. Because God will only forgive those who admit uh, who they are. We have to confess who we are for God ever to be able to work in our lives. Later, the Apostle John would write, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. You can't be healed from a disease that you deny you have. Years ago, I remember mom telling about a friend of hers that She was a kindergarten teacher, I believe, and her stomach started growing. (laughs) And it grew and grew until it looked like she was pregnant. She was a single lady. She ignored it, just got a bigger dress. Kept getting bigger and bigger until when she would sit down, her stomach would hang out over her knees. It was so big. 
Until finally, she wouldn't talk about it. If someone tried to talk about it, no, she didn't want to talk about it. Just end of discussion. Until finally her ankles gave out. They had to take her to the doctor to discover that she had a tumor. And if I remember right, the tumor was like 150 pounds and the fluid was another 50. It was almost 200 pounds they took off of her. You see, you can't be healed unless you admit that I have a problem. And that is the way it is with sin in our life. Jesus gave this Samaritan woman a chance uh, to admit who she was. uh, And he spelled out her sin. And she, at this point, could have simply agreed with him and identified her need for God's mercy. And had she done so, he would have immediately forgiven her. But instead, she does what so many of us do. She tries to distract Jesus with a diversion to get into an intellectual debate that would take the heat off of her. And so she says to him, Sir, I can see that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Without missing a beat, she was trying to distract Jesus with some flattery and then diverting him into a a, a debate that was a popular debate of that time. And the heated question was, where do we worship? Where must worship take place? Who is right? I think deep down inside, she realized that this living water was going to cost her something. Belief in the gospel necessitates a willingness to not only admit who we are, but then to also commit to God changing some things in our life. It's a human nature to seek a no-fault salvation that says you can have your cake and eat it too. You can have salvation without transformation. But true belief demands repentance, and repentance demands a willingness to, to live under God's control instead of our own, to live under God's control. That's something that that we resist, isn't it? Becca was sharing with me this week about our grandson, Eli. And Friday, Eli, I guess, I don't know what, but uh, things broke out in his life and he was mad. And he was throwing a royal tantrum on the floor, kicking and screaming, the whole works. And so it was early in the evening, and his punishment was he's going to bed right now. Without supper, just a peanut butter sandwich, and you're going to bed. And so, as she does, she put him in bed, and then she came in later to talk with him, to have prayer with him, to help him to understand what he'd done and what the punishment was all about. Do you know why you're here? Yeah, because... I threw a tantrum. And she was telling him and explaining to him how she, you know, God wants to be in control of your life. You need to have him to control those things. And usually when, at the end, they have prayer together. And he's just little and, and he usually wants her to pray and he'll repeat. But he said, I'm going to pray. And his prayer was just this. Jesus, I want you to control me. And he looked up at her and he says, I don't know what else to say. And she said, that's enough. I want you to control me. That's what we fight, isn't it? Not just a little four-year or five-year-old kid, but we all fight that. We don't want to be controlled. But yet that's the prayer that we have to pray. There was a battle going on in her. Jesus didn't rudely walk away from the questions, this this ploy to turn attention elsewhere. He didn't declare some sar- deliver some sarcastic lecture to her about you need to not think about that. You need to think about your own immorality. He talked to her about where to worship. He drew her back quickly from that distraction to the real issue of her sin. And he says to her, a time is coming and now has come when the true worshiper will worship the Father in spirit and truth. 
that it's not the place that you worship, it's the condition of your heart as you worship. Going to Hyde Wesleyan Church will not get you into heaven. All right? I'm glad you're here this morning. But if you come every time we have the doors open, that in itself will not get you into heaven. And Jesus said it doesn't matter which mountain you worship on, whether it's Mount Gerizim or whether it's Jerusalem, it's the condition of your heart. The proverb says, he who conceals his sin does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. You see, sinfulness is no problem to God. He can forgive without limit, but sinfulness that tries to hide, that's a problem. Is there sin in our life that we're trying to cover up? We spend so much time in our culture finding new ways to describe sin so that it doesn't sound so bad. But if you put lipstick on a pig, It's still a pig. And no matter what culture may say that 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 is, it's not as bad, it's still sin. God won't allow us to cover sin with some intellectual argument. He's fully able to forgive and deliver us from sin. He said, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. The Samaritan woman must have responded to his requirements because the main impression that she took back when she ran back into town to tell everybody what her experience was, it was this. He told me everything I ever did. She didn't go back in there and describe the intellectual argument of where they were to worship, the theological bantering that went on. Instead, her life was changed because... uh, of a God that saw her as she was and was willing to forgive her. The Messiah sought and found this woman of Samaria, and he satisfied her thirst with a fountain of living water. She runs back to the village. She tells others about him. They, in turn, come and hear, and they asked him to stay two days, and many of them, it said, believed him, to be the savior of the world, and their lives were changed. Remember that these Samaritans who invited Jesus and his disciples to stay with them were invited, hated Jews to stay in their town. A miraculous truce in this war between the Jews and Samaritans and the coming of salvation that followed it, all because one woman came to faith and was willing to go and tell others what had happened. When God finds us, we want to help him find the lost ones in our world. After spending one day with Jesus, Andrew believed him, and it says that he went and found someone else. As a new believer, he finds his brother and brings Peter to Jesus. And look what Peter became because one person said, come and see. Philip followed Jesus. And as he responded, he took time to go and invite Nathaniel to come. Matthew, the tax collector, trusted Christ and then put on a large banquet for other tax collectors to come so they could hear and know him too. Have you allowed Jesus to give you an assignment in his harvest field? Maybe I should rephrase that because I don't think that it's really an option. He has an assignment for everyone. Have we accepted our assignment in his harvest field? I know she might not like this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Many of you may not even know this woman. She's sitting back there in the corner. (laughs) Gloria Gill. But you're sitting here today because of her. 
whether you know it or not. Gloria was the first person to get saved when we came to high. And for many years she struggled with an addiction to cigarettes that she just couldn't beat, and it affected her spiritually. Until one day, God delivered her from that, set her free. But he not only delivered her, he put something in her that she couldn't keep quiet. And she began inviting people to church. Up until that time, our church was just flatlined, 33, 34, 35 for years. That was our average. But when God put something in her that caused her to, it just bubbled out. And for years, I could connect almost everybody in our church, either directly from her invitation or the web of someone she invited that invited someone that invited someone. And our church began to grow. What am I saying? God put something in us that causes us to want to be a part and partner with him in the harvest of those that are lost just like we were before. The Samaritan woman could have listed, do, listed dozens of reasons why she shouldn't be the one to tell her village about Christ. She had a reputation of immorality. She would fear ridicule if she comes to them and she'd got religion and, oh yeah, I, be, I bet. She was an outcast. She was someone that no one wanted to talk to. It's indicated by the fact that she comes alone to draw water at noontime. It's a custom of the, you know, a part of drawing water in that culture was a social thing. The women would all go together out to the well in the morning, in the cool of the day, and they would socialize. It was an event, everybody, you know, sharing and, and, and laughing. But she goes in the middle of the day. She's an outcast. Why would anyone listen to her? She could have used her lack of social status to keep the news of the Messiah to herself. But Christ in us is like putting a box of detergent into a water fountain. Like they did out in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Someone put a bunch of dessert, uh, detergent into a big fountain in front of Red Robin. Looks neat, doesn't it? You ought to try it somewhere sometime. <laughs> but you put a box of uh, of suds into a, a fountain, you're going to have a, 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 an overflow. And that's what happens in our lives. When this woman pointed those she knew to Jesus, the whole village changed. God comes to us in our need. He wants to remove our sin if we will confess it. And then he lifts us up to work alongside of him in the mission of touching a needy world that needs to know the message of salvation. The Great Commission is still our mandate. Go and make disciples of all people. Go. Until the world is evangelized and Jesus comes back, we are under orders to take the good news to all the world. To our world. It's estimated that a third of the earth's population has not yet even heard the name of Jesus. They don't even know about Jesus. And there's another third that have heard his name but don't have enough information to really make a decision, understand what it's about. Now many times we think of this and we think, okay, there are people that don't know. So those people are over there. For the most part, maybe we could say those people are over there. But the people that have heard about Jesus but really don't have enough information, you see some of those people every day. We think, oh, in America, everybody knows. There are people that know he's a curse word. They know that people go to church and talk about him, but they don't know him. And some of us are rubbing shoulders with those people each and every day. These are people that God loves. These are people that Jesus died for. And he wants to tell them. And so our job is to go. In many ways, maybe here at Hyde we are doing a somewhat good job in some areas. 
certainly in our missions and our giving to missions, we are, we are doing more than others, put it that way. We are many times listed in the top 100 of churches that give to missions. We have sent out people into the mission field, into the pastorals. In the last 20 years, we've, there's been someone like 15 people that have been called into service and have gone into full-time Christian service. As I said last Sunday, we go on mission trips. I counted the other day, 56 mission trips that have gone out from our church since I've been here. You saw up on the screen, we've given $64,000 in pennies to, to help children in Africa. That's great. But let me share something with you. All of that does not get us off the hook from sharing the good news with our neighbor. It does not get us off the hook of being a witness to what Christ has done. It does not get me off the hook of sharing my story that God has done in my life with my coworkers, with my neighbors, with my families. God has chosen us to take Christ into our community. He has chosen me to introduce others to Jesus. Not just to invite them to church. That's, that's part of it. We can invite people to church. But too many times we excuse ourselves from being that person that introduces someone to the Jesus that we say we love by saying, well, I gave to, to missions or I invited them to church. As Christ offered himself up on the cross, he calls us to present our bodies living sacrifices. This involves all that we are and all that we have. It involves giving, but it also involves going. One day I want to be able to sing with all of the redeemed, worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. I don't think there will be any other joy greater other than our own salvation and knowing that we have reached heaven, that there will be any other joy greater than being there, standing arm and arm, side by side, with someone that I had brought to the well. Someone that I have brought to Jesus. And not only those that I've brought, but those that they have brought. And those that they have brought. Some of them will be people that we have never met. Some of them will be people that our missionaries have gone to and we have supported and been a part of their salvation. But it all starts with meeting Jesus at the well and confessing our sin and leaving our sin and allowing our lives to be transformed and then taking up the, the, the call that he puts on our life to be a part of inviting people into the kingdom. One of these days we are going to be gathered around the throne and sing, Worthy is the Lamb. We're going to watch a video. And I hope that as you listen to it and watch it, that you will envision that day when you will be around the throne and that you will see people there. Just envision what it will be like to see someone there, that they are there because you shared Jesus with them.
Father God, I can only imagine what that day will be like when we stand in your presence and declare that you are Lord and that you're worthy of all our praise. Lord, I pray that as we appreciate what you have done in our lives and what you have made of us and the change and transformation that Lord, we just found it too easy to keep it to ourselves. Forgive us, Lord, and I pray that you will put within our hearts this week a desire to share and open opportunities for us to do so. Father, there could be someone's eternal destiny resting upon what we do even this week with the good news that you have put within our hearts. Father, I pray that you will help us to go out of here determined to be a missionary, determined to be the bearer of good news, determined to let Jesus live through us. Lord, I pray that if we haven't tasted of that water, that we will, we will allow ourselves to take advantage of the opportunity God gives us to drink deeply. So Lord, we go this week thanking you for your grace, thanking you for salvation, thanking you for transformation, and thanking you for the opportunities that we're going to have to be your hands and feet and the voice of your message, of your loving the world so much that you gave your son. Thank you. Amen.